just like to thank the organizers for, for inviting me to speak. Uh, I've been having a wonderful time. Um, okay, so let me just start with a, a very vague, very general question. I have a fixed graph H, sort of, for the rest of the talk, think of H as always being some sort of fixed graph. And, and we want to look at all graphs G, which do not contain H, under some model of, of graph containment. I mean, the standard ones are induced subgraph or containing H as a subdivision or as a minor. And we want to know what that tells us about the graph G. What can I say about G if it excludes that H? And, and one of, the, one of the more famous results in this, this area is the structure theorem of Robertson and Seymour. And it says that every graph which does not contain H as a minor can be decomposed into, quote, a tree structure of graphs which, quote, almost embed in bounded genus surfaces. So within those, those quotes, there's, there's a large amount of, of technicalities, and I don't want to dive into those today. I want to keep this theorem as a reference and instead look at uh, a model of graph containment which has maybe received less attention till now, which is that of uh, vertex minors. So, uh, in a way, vertex minor is a model of graph containment that's sort of in between traditional graph minors and induced subgraphs. It has properties of, of both these, these models of containment. So, Towards the Robertson-Seymour theorem, sort of the very first step you do when you want to prove uh, the structure of graphs excluding a fixed minor is they start with uh, graphs which can be decomposed into this tree structure instead of graphs almost embedded in surface, just into bounded size chunks, into bounded size subgraphs. And this yields their uh, tree decompositions of graphs. And today we want to look at a similar tree-like decomposition within this theory of excluded vertex minors instead of, vertex, instead of graph minors. So I'm going to give a quick refresher on decompositions, tree decompositions of graphs, uh, oops, and look at the Robertson-Seymour uh, grid theorem for graphs of bounded tree widths before moving on to the analogs for vertex minors. So that is, uh, we'll look at rank decompositions and the rank width of a graph. And then from there, I want to present a grid theorem for, for rank width within this context of, of vertex minors. And then a, uh, in the last portion of the talk, I want to talk about where we go from there. What's that next step towards a, a structure theory for vertex minors after we've proven the grid theorem for rank width? OK. so. A tree decomposition. I said uh, this quote-unquote tree decomposition, I'm actually going to tell you what that quote-unquote is. So a tree decomposition, it's a pair, T is a tree, and then X are the subsets of the vertices of a graph G, and they're indexed by the vertices of the tree. So to each vertex of the tree, I assign a subset of the vertices of G, and I want these subsets to have the following properties. So I want every edge of the graph G to be contained inside one of these subsets. We, we typically call them bags, the bags xi. So every edge is in some bag xi. And the vertices are not assigned to a unique bag. Vertices are going to be in a variety of bags on the tree. The one constraint I have is that all the bags which contain a single vertex V all have to induce a connected subtree of the tree T. So the bags containing V consist of these four vertices of the tree, and that's a connected uh, path in this case. So obviously, I can always find a tree decomposition of a graph, right? Because I could take the trivial tree of a single vertex, take one bag, and put all of G in the bag. So the, the trick is not to find a tree decomposition. The trick is to find one where the bags are as small as possible. And so the tree width is, over all possible tree decompositions, I want to minimize the maximum size of a bag. And then there's this little minus one factor for historical reasons. But Think of it as, I want to minimize the maximum size of a bag. So what are the motivations for studying tree width? So uh, today we're primarily concerned with how this is, this is uh, uh, really the foundation of the excluded minor theorem of Robertson and Seymour. Tree yeah. is zero, the tree width of a tree. No. What? A tree width of a tree. Uh, you have to put one edge in each bag. So every edge has to have, bag has to have size at least two. 
And so a tree has tree width 1. And in fact, that's why this minus 1 is there. It's a little fudge factor to force trees to have tree width 1. But beyond uh, sort of their applications in, in structure theory, uh, there are a lot of algorithmic applications as well of the tree width of graphs. So in general, hard problems, uh, think colorability, independent set, et cetera, can be solved efficiently in graphs of bounded tree widths. So in fact, Courcelle has a very nice theorem that says that any graph property expressible within this mm, technical uh, logic, monadic second order logic, uh, has a linear time algorithm to resolve it in graphs, restricted to graphs of bounded tree width. So as, as we just said, trees have tree width one. Uh, the graphs of tree width two are exactly the series parallel graphs. And now what graphs have large tree width? You can think for a sec while I drink water. So one example is clicks, right? In fact, if you think for a second from the definition, a click uh, will have to have every vertex of the click contained in some bag of the tree decomposition. So a click has tree width uh, at least, kt has tree width, well, it should be t minus 1 there, but think order t. Another example are grids. So the k by k grid has tree width k. And another example would be expander graphs. Expander graphs actually have tree width linear in the uh, order of the uh, number of vertices. So how does that relate to graph miners? How do these treaty compositions relate to graph miners? So let me remind you first off what the definition of a graph miner is. So to contract an edge in a graph, I just identify the two endpoints and delete any resulting parallel edges. Think of just squishing u and v together to form a single vertex here. And now a graph h is a minor of a graph g if I can if I can obtain H by repeatedly deleting and contracting edges. So going back to tree width, tree width is monotonic undertaking minors. Right? So if I take a G, uh, sorry, if I take a tree decomposition of the graph G and I want to delete an edge, well obviously I'm still left with a, a tree decomposition of the resulting graph, right? And instead, if I want to contract an edge, G contract E, well, what did I do? I just squished that edge to a single vertex. So I just leave the squished vertex inside every bag, and each bag still is going to satisfy the properties, and the bag at most has decreased in size. So the tree width of the graph, I'm, I'm still left with a good tree decomposition of the graph, and uh, the width has not increased. So what that means is that if I contain, as a minor, one of these examples that we had before, a grid, a click, an expander graph, the tree width has to be at least the tree width of those guys. So specifically, if I contain the k by k grid as a minor, then the tree width of g is at least k. And then Robertson and Seymour showed the converse is approximately true. That is, it's not an if and only if statement, but for all k, there exists some r, so that if I have tree width at least that value, then I contain the k by k grid as a minor. So another way of thinking about this is that grids are the, the canonical graphs forcing large tree width. OK, so that's our, our, the end of our introduction on, on tree width and miners. Let's go towards uh, vertex miners. So first, let's talk about separations for the moment. So a separation of G is a pair AB of subsets of the graph so that they cover all the vertices. And now no edge has an end in A minus B and another end in B minus A. So you can think of the intersection here as just being a cut set separating A minus B from B minus A. And the order of the separation is the, uh, the size of this cut set. So now when I look at a tree decomposition, every edge of the tree decomposition splits the graph into two subsets A and B. I just take all the bags on one side of the, uh, the cut defined by that edge and all the bags on the other side of the cut. And that's going to have exactly this property. I'm not going to have any edge which jumps from, oops, jumps from a vertex here to a vertex here which is not in the intersection of these two bags. So it defines a separation. So another way of thinking about a tree decomposition of a graph 
is it's a way, the, the tree defines a bunch of nested separations of bounded order, which, which decompose the graph down into uh, constant size pieces. So I, I have a nested family of separations breaking the graph down into constant size pieces, where each of those separations has bounded order. So for example, the edge 3, 2 here of the tree defines a separation where I take the union of these bags. And now the order of that separation is the size of the intersection of these two bags. And so if the whole tree decomposition has bounded order, I'm sorry, if each of the bags has bounded order, then obviously their intersection is also of bounded order. So moving towards vertex modules, we want an alternate definition of, of separations in graphs. So I want to think of a different separation where I partition the vertices into two sets, say x and y, and I look at all the vertices of x which send an edge across to vertices of y. So I've just numbered the vertices uh, of x and y which send an edge across that edge cut. And now I look at the bipartite uh, adjacency matrix of that bipartite subgraph between x and y. Right? So that just defines uh, a 0, 1 matrix. And now I want to let the, 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 the order of the cut, the rank of the cut, to be the rank of this bipartite matrix, bipartite adjacency matrix, over GF2. So the rank connectivity of this cut is exactly that, the rank of the matrix between those two guys. So this allows me to define an alternate way to decompose the graph down on bounded size cuts. Uh, looking instead at this alternate measure of what I mean by a bounded size cut. Right, so I define a rank decomposition to be a subcubic tree where I assign the vertices of G to the leaves of the tree. Right? So this is my graph that I'm decomposing. I define a subcubic tree and I assign a vertex of G to each leaf of the tree. Right? So now every edge of this tree defines a partition of the vertices of G, right? So I split off A and D from E, B, C in the example, right? And the width of the decomposition is now the maximum of the rank of those cuts over all edges of the tree T. Right. So this is, a, this is another decomposition, right? It's, it's an alternate way of decomposing with nested cuts uh, decomposing the graph with a nested series of cuts. So, Kante showed in 2007 that uh, if the tree, I have tree width at most k, then g also has rank width at most uh, 4k. So there's a bounded relationship between the two and this. If the tree width is bounded, then the rank width is also bounded. But the converse does not hold. So what again were those uh, three examples we had? We had the click and uh, the grid and the expander graphs. But think about the click for a second. If I take any partition of the vertices of the click, what's the graph going between the two sides? It's just going to be the complete bipartite graph between the two sides. So what's the matrix I'm getting? The bipart adjacency matrix is just the matrix of all ones. It has rank one. So every cut of the click has rank one, and so the rank width of this graph is obviously going to be one. Just take any subcubic tree and assign the leaves, and I get that. Instead, the grids have large rank width, and expander graphs also have large rank width as well. So it's not the same notion. They differ, specifically, they differ on the case of the click. And this kind of points out also at least the algorithmic motivation behind looking at uh, rank width as a decomposition. Because, I mean, obviously, a lot of problems are still easy to resolve when I'm looking at a click. So maximum independent set, maximum weighted independent set, subgraph isomorphism, they're all easy to solve. And rank width gives uh, an alternate measure that allows me to still efficiently resolve these problems when the rank width is bounded. So there's a sort of an analog of Courcelles' theorem that uh, uh, give a logical characterization of problems that are efficiently solvable on graphs of mounted tree width in the rank width case. It's no longer linear, we're getting a cubic time algorithm, but we can still resolve uh, this technical class of problems uh, efficiently in graphs of bounded rank width. What is the first kind, uh, MSL is the first kind, is that 
Yeah, I'd have to look it up. I don't know off the top of my head. <coughs> so if you're thinking in your head about this, this it's, it's weird to think about the, the, the rank over GF2 of this, this bipartite, uh, sorry, of this 0-1 matrix. You can also think about it just in terms of forbidden subgraphs as well. So if I look at all the vertices of Y, uh, let me make sure I'm going the right way. Yeah, so all the subsets of X, which are the neighborhood of, uh, of a vertex in Y. How I'll look at sort of all the distinct possibilities I have for neighborhoods of a vertex in Y. So <clears throat> the, a lower bound for that amount is obviously the rank of that matrix. If I have t different uh, neighborhoods across, then uh, I can't have less than, sorry. Well, yeah. So the number of neighborhoods across would be the number of distinct vectors I have. So the rank of that matrix is obviously, uh, uh, can't, be, uh, can't be more than the rank of, sorry, then, then can't be more than the number of distinct columns I have in my bipartite matrix. That's all it's saying here. And then an upper bound would be the, of the matrix would be the number of distinct columns I have as well. So I can just apply Ramsey to that bipartite graph where I just look at all the distinct neighborhoods across and there are sort of a series of canonical examples of induced subgraphs I can have between X and Y. So I could have an induced matching between the two uh, a complement of an, or induced complement of a matching, or a third example, what we call a half graph. So a half graph uh, of order 2k, it's a bipartite graph with vertices x1 to xk, y1 to yk, where xi is adjacent to yj for j less than or equal to i. So y1 is adjacent to everyone on the left, y2 is adjacent to x2, and everyone below x2, and so on and so forth. So you get this sort of symmetrical thing across. And so if you don't want to think about the rank of the bipartite matrix, you can also just up to a, approximately looking at the, uh, the width of the cut, the rank of the cut, think about the largest induced subgraph I have of one of these three types. The largest uh, induced matching, complement of a matching, or half graph as an induced subgraph between those two sets. Okay, so rank width is not monotonic under edge deletion, right? Why is that? Well, take the click. The click had rank width one, but any graph I can obtain as a, uh, from edge deletion from the click. So obviously at some point the rank width will have to go up upon deleting an edge. But it is monotonic under vertex deletion. So if I look at my rank decomposition I had before, and I want to delete the vertex D, well, I just delete that leaf from the uh, rank decomposition, and I still have a decomposition of the graph. So it's monotonic under vertex deletion, uh, and therefore rank width is monotonic under taking induced subgraphs. Okay, but there's a second operation, too, that we're going to use in the definition of vertex minors, and that's this operation of local complementation. So to locally complement at a vertex V, so I denote it G star V, I just look at the neighborhood of V and take the complement on that subgraph. So I swap the adjacency relationship on the neighborhood of a vertex V. And the rest of G remains unchanged. And this is the definition of vertex minor. So vertex minor are the graphs that I can obtain by repeatedly doing this local complementation operation and deleting vertices. And it's not too hard to show that uh, if I take any partition uh, of a vertices of a graph G and some vertex, and I take the local complementation under that, on that vertex, so I flop, uh, flip the adjacency relationship on its neighborhood, then the rank of the cut between those two doesn't change. So what that tells us is that rank width is monotonic undertaking vertex minors as well. So, 
This local complementation operation may seem a little bit uh, convoluted or arbitrary uh, if you haven't thought about it before, but there is a class of graphs for which it's very natural, and that's the class of circle graphs. So a graph is a circle graph if it can be represented as the intersection graph of chords on a circle. Right? So here I have a graph, and I've represented it. Uh, each vertex of the graph on the left is a chord on the right, and the adjacencies are determined by whether or not the two chords cross. So this is a class of graphs which is closed under local complementation. So let's see why. So I have my graph G, the chord representation of G, and now I take a local complementation at B. So here's what it looks like. I flip the, uh, flip the adjacency relations already. Now what happens in the chord representation? So what I want to do is I want to just look at the edges, uh, sorry, just look at the vertices which are adjacent to the vertex B. So over here, here's the chord corresponding to B. And the, ver the chords which correspond to the neighborhood are exactly the chords which cross over from the left side to the right side. And what I want to do is flip the adjacency relationship on those chords. So what's that saying? I basically want to, if they cross, I want them not to cross and vice versa. If they don't cross, at the end, I want them to cross. So what I can do is just think of cutting this circle on the two endpoints of A and B, taking the right side, flipping the, the circle, and then gluing it back together. And this flip will exactly swap the uh, crossingness of all the edges going from left to right, all the chords going from left to right. And so I put it back together. Instead, the chords, which had both ends on one side or the other, who they cross isn't going to change by swapping the, the right half of the circle, swapping the orientation of the right half of the circle. So, the conclusion is that the class of circle graphs is closed under taking vertex minors. We just proved that it was closed under uh, local complementation, and it's obviously closed under deletion because I could just delete a chord from the chord representation. So, what that says then, well, we already said that, uh, oops, that uh, the rank width is monotonic under taking vertex minor. So any graph with a large grid vertex minor also has large rank width. But this is not the theorem we want. The converse is not true. So you can actually prove that uh, grids are universal. Any graph can be obtained as a vertex minor of a grid. They're almost like the analog of clicks in the minor case. So the theorem we want is not the exact grid theorem for our vertex minors. We need a different definition of quote unquote grid. And what we want is what's called the path of half graphs. So uh, length 2k and width t, so it's a bipartite graph. And I'm alternating between x vertices and y vertices. And then between each group of uh, t vertices here, the first t x's and the first t y's, I have a half graph. And between the first t y's and the second t x's, I have a half graph again. And I go along like this k times. So if you wanted to prove that this graph had large rank width, how would you do it? Well, think for a second. Take any uh, partition of the graph and say I cut between one of these half graphs, well then I have a large induced half graph between the left and the right. And I'm going to get a, uh, a large, uh, then uh, there will be a large rank cut. Instead, if I take a separation going sort of diagonal so that I don't cut across, well I'm going to get an induced matching going across like that. So no matter how I partition the vertices into two big sets, I'm always going to get either a large half graph between the two sides or a large induced matching between the two sides. And so I can't have a bounded rank width decomposition of this graph. So what we prove is that this is the analog of the grid theorem now for vertex minors. So for all k and t, there's just an r such that if I have sufficiently big rank width, rank width at least r, then g contains a path of half graphs of length 2k and width t as 
a vertex miner. So I should say this is joint work with Jim Geeland, Ojang Kwan, uh, Rose McCarthy, she's a uh, recent graduate student of Jim Geeland's, and myself. Okay, so that's the grid theorem. Well, how much time have I used so far? Okay. So I want to actually spend the rest of the, of, the, of the talk not delving into the proof of this theorem, but rather... Oh, sorry, before I do that. No, I do want to say one more thing. So there's an equivalent version of the, uh, of the grid theorem, which is since every planar graph H is, is a minor of some sufficiently large grid, and you can see this just by the fact that any planar graph can be drawn on a sufficiently big computer screen, right? I mean, a computer screen is really exactly a, uh, a grid. And if I can draw it as on a computer screen, then I can also take it as a minor of that sufficiently high resolution grid that we have. So another way of formulating the grid theorem is that every planar graph H, there exists an R, so if I have tree with at least R, then I contain H as a minor. And the point is that circle graphs are the analog here of planar graphs for minors. So circle graphs for vertex minors are the analog of planar graphs for regular graph minors. Because the path of half graphs is also a circle graph. So here I have the path of half graphs of length uh, 2k and width 3. And I can just draw it as a red matching here, the blue matching going across. So the first blue edge crosses 1, 2, 3. The second blue edge crosses 1, 2. The third blue edge crosses just the last one. So between these first three red and first three blue, I have exactly the half graph. And I can just repeat a chain of those going through across the circle. So the path of half graphs is a circle graph. And you can show without too much work that every circle graph is a vertex minor of a sufficiently large path of half graphs. So we get exactly the same analog now uh, for vertex minors as we did for graph minors. So for every circle graph H, by having sufficiently large rank width, I can force a graph G to contain H as a vertex minor. Okay, so now I want to, to talk about how we could possibly take this grid theorem as a starting point for a broader uh, structure theorem for vertex minors. So but in order to do that, let me, let me give a one slide uh, summary of the proof of Robertson Seymour's graph minors, uh, graph minors project. So this is a one slide synopsis of, of 16 hard papers. So if I have bounded tree width, then I have this tree structure uh, into the bound side pieces. So I can restrict my attention to graphs which have big tree width. And the grid theorem says that they have a large grid minor. And just from the definition of minor, it's not too hard to show that if I have a large grid minor, then I contain a large subdivision of what we call a wall. So a wall is this uh, maximum degree three uh, graph, which kind of looks like a grid. In fact, if I con contract every other edge of these horizontal paths, what I'm going to end up with is just a grid back again. So I contain this as a large subgraph now in my bigger graph G. So the bigger graph G has other edges. It has other edges, other vertices. And what I can do is start looking at how those other edges and how those other vertices attach on to this large subdivision subgraph. So you can think of this as a big sort of canonical planar grid or piece of the, of the graph. And then the rest of the graph is attaching on to this scaffolding. And the point is that, uh, oh, this is what I just said. So one thing that could happen, right, is I could have lots of vertices that each have many attachments spread all throughout the grid. Right? So that would be a way of sort of not respecting the planarity of this, uh, not respecting the planarity of this scaffolding. Right? But it's not too hard to show that if I had many of these blue vertices, each attaching sort of interspersed spread all throughout the wall that I would be able to construct a click minor. And we'll get back to that in a sec. Another possibility is that I could not respect this, uh, the planarity of my scaffolding 
if I had lots of sort of crossing edges attaching into the faces spread all throughout this planar scaffold. But if I did that, it's not too hard to see that if I had, say, what, t squared, constant times t squared, crossing edges attaching in this wall like this, I would again be able to find k sub t as a minor. So the point is that we start with a large grid. We look at how the rest of the graph attaches, and we want to either be able to show that I would have a large click minor, or alternatively, that the rest of the graph has to somehow build onto this planar scaffolding. And that's a, how the proof of the grid minor proceeds with a lot of, of blood, sweat, and tears. So the, the, the forbidden structure theorem starts like this. You start looking at how the rest of the graph attaches, and uh, you sort of almost respect the planarity of your scaffolding, or in more general, you're going to have a bounded genus scaffolding, uh, until you've uh, accounted for all the rest of the graph. All the other vertices and edges have been added back onto your scaffolding, or you're alternatively going to construct the, the click minor. So let's look at the very first thing, sort of first claim I said. So if G has no KT minor, then only a bounded number of vertices can have many attachments spread out all over the wall. Right? And how do you see that? Well, say I had T vertices like this with attachments spread all over the wall. So when I say spread all over the wall, I mean that any time I cut a relatively big subwall here, I contain an attachment of each of these blue vertices. So it's not too hard to see that. In that case, I'm able to construct a click minor. Right? So I cut out T big grids below. They each contain a neighbor of each blue vertex. And so I contract each of the grids I cut below into a single vertex. And what I'm getting is a complete bipartite with the T blue vertices on the top and T contracted vertices below. And then contract a matching if you want in that KTT subgraph and I get a click. So the point is that we sort of stared at this, thought about the edges attaching all over, and we were kind of able to see what we had to squeeze together, what we had to contract together to get the click minor. So this intuition, this sort of intuitive level of, of squinting your eyes and seeing the minor sort of completely falls apart now when we go to the case of vertex minors. And it does it because of this, this local complementation operation. If I give you a big graph and say, OK, complement this vertex, and you look in your head and you sort of mentally delete a bunch of edges and mentally add back in a bunch of edges. And then I say, OK, now do another local complementation here. And already you start trying to double cancel and add some back in. And everything very quickly falls apart. I mean, this local complement, complementation operation completely changes the graph at each step. And so, so you lose this intuitive way of squinting your eyes and, and seeing the graph. And so how are we going to get around this? Well, one thing we can do, at least for circle graphs, is we want to encode circle graphs as a four regular graph and work on that encoding. So let me show the encoding. OK, so we start with our chord diagram of the circle graph. Right? And I add a vertex at each of the endpoints, uh, at both endpoints of each of the chords. Right? So this gives me a three regular graph, right? Where I have uh, the edges are the chords and the uh, sort of arcs of the circle going around. Okay. Now that's a three regular graph. To get to the four regular graph, I just contract each of the chord the edges to a single vertex. So in fact, it's no longer, it's not going to be a simple graph necessarily to be a monthly graph. I could create loops or parallel edges when I contract on. So I'm going to keep that because I really want to maintain this property of four regularness. So this is the graph I'm getting below here. I just contracted everything down and got a four regular graph. In order to reconstruct the original circle graph, uh, I need one more bit of information. And it's the following observation. So the original cyclic order of the vertices here defines a cyclic order of all the edges in my graph. So it defines an Eulerian tour of the edges of this four regular graph. 
So the two things I need to reconstruct back, the encoding is both the four regular graph and a fixed Eulerian tour on that four regular graph. And that's enough to define the original circle graph that I had before. Okay. So I've encoded my circle graph as a four regular graph with a fixed Eulerian tour on the, uh, on the edges. So given that encoding, let's uh, look for a minute at what happens with local complementation. So I'm going to be locally complementing at the vertex B here. So the, uh, the chord B really splits the Eulerian tour into two halves, right? I have a red half and a green half. The red half being corresponding to the left half of the uh, guy here, and the green half corresponding to uh, the right half of the circle of the chord corresponding to B. So green here is the right half, and in fact, I've even indicated the, or the order in which I visit. So starting at the top, I visit B, then A, then F, then, no, sorry, B, D, then A, then C, then F, and then back to B. So D, then A, then C, then F, and back to B. And now when I complemented, took the local complementation at uh, the vertex B, right, what did I do? I unglued my, my circle, flipped the right-hand side, and glued it back together. So what does that do in the encoding? Well, the left-hand side stayed exactly the same, right? The, the Eulerian tour on the left-hand side stayed the same. What happened on the right-hand side is that I just swapped the order in which I visited the vertices. So now on the top, I'm visiting in exactly the opposite order of what I did before. So the point here is that the four regular multigraph was invariant. So that, that's, that's nice, right? The problem was that the local complementation was rearranging my graph and I couldn't see anything. Uh, instead, now I have a single fixed graph to work with, and I just have a bunch of equivalence classes of Eulerian tours on those graphs, which represent all the different locally, uh, all the different graphs I can obtain by local complementation on the original guy. Okay. So the, the encoding is well behaved in terms of uh, the, the operations for vertex miners. What about uh, deleting a vertex, the other operation I have for vertex miners? So when I delete the vertex B here, what happens to my encoding? So before I went from the vertex A to B to D, and now here I just go straight from A to B. So in the encoding, I'm basically going to pass through B without, without stopping. I just take that vertex B and I'm splitting it, splitting off the edges incident to B and treating it like this. Right? So notice that here I'm getting uh, parallel edges and, and I want to keep those to make sure that uh, I still stay a full regular graph. So local complementation doesn't change the graph, it just changes the Euler and Tour and deleting verse corresponds to splitting off edges in the four regular multigraph. Well, those are well-defined operations. Uh, that, those are exactly the operations we have when we're looking at uh, graph immersions. So in graph immersions, I'm allowed to do exactly this operation where I split off, I split off the edges incident in a single vertex, and, uh, uh, well, in graph immersions, I split off the edges inside the vertex and I'm allowed to delete edges. Here, we're working just inside the world of four regular graphs. So I have to split off both edges incident the vertex and then I'm still staying four regular. So essentially what I'm looking at here is spanning uh, immersions in four regular graphs. And that's exactly the analog of taking vertex miners in the circle graph. So vertex miners in the circle graph is the equivalent of spanning immersions in four regular multigraphs. And now going back to this, this problem we had before. So we had a wall with many vertices attaching on. Before it was easy to see that we have no KT, uh, that, that if I had sufficiently many of those blue vertices, I got a KT minor. And now the technical result we're able to prove is the analog of this for vertex miners. So if I take a graph G, I have a large induced circle subgraph of large rank width and many vertices attaching in a sufficiently robust way to G0. 
then G contains H as a vertex minor. So I have many vertices attaching on. Robust here is a way of encoding, attaching everywhere. I need uh, an analog of that for the, the rank uh, definition, or so the rank idea of attaching everywhere. And then we're able to force G to contain an arbitrary H as a vertex minor. And the way we do this is by exactly looking at this four regular uh, encoding of the circle graph and working with immersions inside that four regular encoding. So in the first of, of 150 steps, we've, we've done one. Uh, and, and going forward, hopefully, this, this tool of working with immersions inside four regular graphs will allow us to uh, continue on in this process. So I'll finish there. Uh, thank you.